This week, Drew and I interview Eric Newman, president of J.C. Newman Cigars. J.C. Newman Cigar Company has a long history that dates back more than a century. In fact, 1895, when Julius Caesar Newman rolled out a first cigar in their family barn. From their humble beginnings as a one-man cigar factory, they've survived and prospered through the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, two world wars, the Cuban embargo, excessive taxes, smoking bans, and the rapid consolidation of our cigar industry. And, hopefully in a few months, COVID-19. Visit jcnewman.com. And later on in the show, at Stogie Geeks episode 327, our Stogie Geeks stick of the week is the Placencia Elma Del Fuego. We're going to talk about it. Stogie Geeks 327 starts right now. This is a Security Weekly production. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show. Welcome everyone to the Stogie Geek Show. Joe and I are already silly. Oh yeah. yeah. Joe Hosempa, a.k.a. Joe Hollywood is here with me in studio. I'm fired up. And- Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Confidence. Confidence isn't walking into a room with your nose in the air, thinking you're better than anyone else. It's walking into a room and not having to compare yourself to anyone in the first place. Welcome to episode 327 of Stogie Geeks. I am your host, Joe Hozempa, from an undisclosed COVID-19 location. Today, Drew and I have the opportunity to interview Eric Newman, president of J.C. Newman Cigars. We are going to catch up on all things J.C. Newman, talk a little bit about history, heritage, and of course, moving forward in these times uh, here. But before I introduce Eric, I want to introduce our little dockhead kid from Texas. Drew, what's up? Hey, Joe, what's going on, man? Uh, just same here, thing uh, as last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here, man. I'll tell you, I'm excited. Uh, we got Eric uh, Newman from JC Newman on, and uh, I went and got my uh, my jersey out of the closet. I got a lot of jerseys, by the way. So I got my <laughs> old uh, Buccaneers jersey out because I know he's mm. out of Tampa Bay. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just excited. So Tampa yeah. Bay's got a gift this year. <laughs> oh man, tell me about it. It's gonna be crazy. I'm sure we're gonna there. talk about that too for sure. But I want to oh, welcome yeah. Eric to the show. Eric, how you doing, sir? Great, thank you, and thank you for sending all your Patriots uh, to our team. It's been tw- yeah. it's been 18 years since we've won a playoff game, and mm. our future is now. So we are gonna take care of Mr. Brady and Gabrowski. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And there might be some more following. Uh, over there too because when you talk about chemistry uh in any business and let's face it of a team a a professional sports team is a business as well and um when gronkowski goes down there for fun quote unquote and uh tom and uh rob have fun on the field uh spectacular things happen that that's just my prediction but it is what it is we're gonna see you know for sure it's been a long time since we've had any fun <laughs> at Raymond James Stadium here in Tampa, so we are due. We are overdue, so thank you. You you are overdue, for sure, for sure, absolutely. Want to get a chance to talk to you a little bit about J.C. Newman Cigars, uh, your role as president, if you want to get into a little bit of the family, talk about that. And then, obviously, you know, you, you, you're the oldest cigar factory here in the United States, very rich in history. You you have a lot of things happening all pre-COVID-19. You have a big uh, restoration and renovation project. You're turning uh, – 
the goal uh, is to have that be a uh, walk-in tour as well. So, so, so people when when they're in the area can can go down there. Um, I've been following you and your social media. Uh, looks like you've dug up some pretty cool artifacts during that restoration and renovation effort there. And then I want to obviously get into uh, how business is now, and you know. You've you guys survived the Great Depression, few world wars, Cuban embargo. I'm sure um, you will survive this too. So welcome to Stogie Geeks, and uh, if you could start with uh, any of those topics, that would be awesome. Well, thanks, Joe. You you wrote you read the uh, our by byline about all the challenges we've had. This is our 125th year in business, and we've had a lot of challenges. About 100 of those years have been challenges. One area we did not. But in there, we should have added is the 1918 pandemic of the Spanish flu. We survived that too. I didn't even know what I couldn't even spell pandemic until mm. about two months ago. But anyway, we got an interesting history. My grandfather was born in Hungary, Austria Hungary, in 1875. He immigrated to the United States, settled in, in Cleveland in 1888, came with his four brothers two sisters, his parents, in search of the American dream. They settled in Cleveland because that's where the big Hungarian district was at that time. My grandfather was 13. He couldn't speak English, had to get a job. His brothers became tailors. That's what immigrants did. They made clothes. My grandfather didn't want to be a tailor, so his mother paid a cigar maker $3 a month to teach her son uh, how to make cigars. He became a great cigar apprentice when he was 15 and 18 uh, in 1890, big recession in Cleveland in 1893, 94, let off all the cigar makers, really off a lot of people in Cleveland. And so sitting around home one day, 1895, and back then women would go to the grocery store every day because they had no electricity, no refrigeration. So she finally tells the grocer, you know, I, I come and buy all my groceries from you every day. How about buying cigars for my son? So she comes home with an order for 500 cigars. Again, yeah, this was 1895. Then my grandfather was going to make cigars, but he had no money. He had to borrow $50 from his mother, found some old boards, and with $50, he bought two bales of tobacco, found some old boards, converted the family barn into a one-man cigar factory. My grandfather was a great talker, better than I am. He got an order for 2,500 cigars from the local saloon. They got an order for 10,000 cigars from Cleveland's largest wholesale grocer. He got so many orders, he couldn't make them all himself. So he got some of his other buddies to come work for him in May of 1895. And then the family barn. Life was great. Five employees, got a good business, 20 years old, yada, yada, yada. But what happened was the uh, barn's not heated. Winter comes, so he moved mm. cigar makers into the family basement. And after a couple of weeks, his mother discovered that her fruits and vegetables, which she canned for the winter, start to taste like cigars, kicks them out of the house and has to set up a storefront in downtown Cleveland. And um, that is how we started. My grandfather started, there were 42,000 licensed cigar manufacturers. You have to have a license to make cigars to pay federal excise taxes, even then. And out of those 42,000 cigar manufacturers from 1895, we're the only ones left. That's still owned and operated by the founding family. And we've been, mm. we went, we went from, uh, stayed in Cleveland until 1953. And there's a lot of stories while we came down to Tampa, but my grandfather's 78 years old. He was, uh, figured if he's going to stay in the cigar business, he wanted to go major, uh, specialized in premium cigars. In the early fifties, kind of interesting. There are five big cigar companies trying to run the little guys. Like my grandfather, I have a business. The big companies grew their own tobacco. Maybe it cost them $3 a pound. But they go to the farmers and offer maybe $6 a pound, which they themselves could average down with what they grew. But they did this to establish a fictitiously high price of tobacco that the little guys, like my grandfather, couldn't afford. So my grandfather, Grandpa J.C., said if he's going to stay in the scar business, he had to find a niche of the scar business where the big guys weren't in. And back then, the big companies were only in the mass market cigars. My grandfather decided, let's get into premium business. And in 1953, there's only one section in the United States making premium cigars. And that was Tampa, Florida. So we moved down to Tampa, where we've been ever since. And Tampa mm -hmm. has been the fine cigar capital of the world. Tampa 
at one time had 150 cigar factories in its heyday. And when we moved, moved, we moved here in 53, there were 10 big family-owned companies all making Cuban cigars, Cuban filler, Cuban binder, Cuban wrapper. Then the Cuban embargo came in January 1962, and one by one, all the other companies uh, got out of the business. They moved offshore. They, they merged with other companies up north. And uh, so we are the only one left in Tampa. This is 125th year in business. Right. And right now it's 100, like you said, it's 125th years in business. Wanna, uh, it's amazing how like today this business conversation is so relevant, right? Um, you know, where we're, uh, pre premium cigars, highly restricted back then, like you said, with licenses and all that stuff. Now it's even more restricted. Now we have this COVID-19 pandemic coming through. We have to change some regulations and pivot. Uh, talk to me a little bit about like the resilience that obviously any business that's been around for over 100 years has to really have to really pivot and position themselves so that they can keep going. Because, you know, you obviously you roll cigars on location as well. You employ people. You have a business to operate. Now with COVID, it's it's kind of a challenge. I get that. But it something tells me that, you know, it's not it's nothing probably what any hundred year business has been through, um, you know, if they've been around there because, you know, th they will prosper again and we will get to some sort of a level of normal. It's just going to take time. So talk to me a little bit about that resilience and patience that the business has. Of our 125 years in business, about hundred years have been one challenge after another. It's been the two world wars, the great depression, pandemic, um, Cuban embargo, in fact, uh, I got into business in 1972. I've seen some some things too. I mean, and then we have a family business, and family businesses are difficult going from one generation to the to a second generation to a third generation. In 1986, we had a family buyout. My grandfather had four kids. My father ran manufacturing. My uncle ran the sales, and two sisters collected dividends when there were did dividends. But the business was tough. In the 1980s, we had no taxes, you didn't smoke anywhere, no regulations, but business sucked. It was awful. And then, um, then um, in 1986, uh, one third of our family, my father, my brother, and they bought out our relatives. They got the money, we got the debt and the opportunity for a long time. We thought they got the best part of the deal. And we had a cigar boom came in the, with Scar Fisonado in the 1990s. And uh, up until the 80s, somebody asked you what kind of business you're in. You're saying, I'm in a business. You mumble it because you're almost embarrassed to be in the cigar business. The 90s come, cigars become so trendy, trendy, so popular. So in movie stars and athletes had their own cigars. It became really the, really the stud to have your own product. And cigar, cigar boom peaked in uh, December of 1997, but it's still a good business to, 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 to today. There's a lot of people, when the scar boom came, there were 100 factories opened up overnight due to PC action. When it closed, about 95% about of them had, had closed. Still a few people around. These are challenging times for our business. Um, we have smoking bans. People like our cigars. You can't smoke them anywhere. Now we have cigar taxes. We have the biggest cigar tax ever in history of American, biggest tax in history of American business. When I got in the business, there was a two cents cigar excise tax on cigars. Now there's 40 cents. That cigar you're smoking, Drew, is the 40 cent excise tax. That's the first sale. So it's been, and now we have FDA regulations we've been battling for 10, 10 years. And I was telling some of these people that have gotten the business the last 25 years, they complain about how tough this is. This is not tough. I mean, sure, we got you can't. We got the smoking bans and the taxes and the FDA, and now you got you got this coronavirus. But we got a business. Back in the, if you have a business, you can figure out how to make it go. Back in the eighties, there was no business. Business was very poor back 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 then. So we're adjusting. I think the reason we've been able to stay in business as long as we have, we've been able to embrace change, and in business to be that long. You have to, to be successful in any business, you have to work hard, 
You have to work smart. It takes a certain amount of luck along the way. And we've been very for fortunate. In 1990, actually 1986, we formed a, a relationship with a Carlos Fuente family. And they started making our La Unica and then Quest to Race cars in 1986. In 1990, we started to distribute Arturo Fuente cigars around the country. In 1990, Arturo Fuente was not a well-known brand. Our strength as a company, we always had a good sales and distribution. We never had our own handmade factory up until about 10, 10, 10 years ago. The Fuente strength was they made the best cigars in the world. They still do. In the factory in the Dominican Republic, they sold their cigars through through brokers. So we formed a partnership, which now is our Toro Fuente Cigar Company. It used to be Fuente Newman. We distribute uh, Fuente cigars all over the, the country. So even to this day, the Fuentes can focus on what they do best, make, make cigars. They make our Dama Crown and their Fuente. And, and uh, we can do what we do best is get them, get them out in the marketplace. Of course, now, here we are... Um, Probably the biggest challenge we've had in quite a while, but with with this COVID nineteen, I think about eighty percent of our smoke shops are either closed or they're working restricted hours. Some are going to the curb service business, which makes it difficult. They're still trying to figure out how that works. The online people are doing well, are doing quite well. Liquor stores are doing well. It's evidently you can't. All the bars have closed. So people still have to drink, so, so people are going to liquor stores. But it's been a challenge. We've been resilient. Um, this, is, this is what the toughest thing I've seen with this coronavirus. There's one difference, though, between this challenge and all the other challenges we've had with smoking bans and cigar taxes and FDA regulation. We've been fighting FDA regulation, and they could really put us out of business, and we're battling them since... 2011, and actually it's before then when Congress passed this bill tried to regulate cigarettes and smokeless, and they had an agenda to get rid of all tobacco, but they weren't after cigars at that time. They're, they're, they were concerned with youth access to tobacco and health consequences, and kids don't smoke cigars. They don't smoke premium uh, cigars, and um, it's been proven that um, – as far as health is concerned, the average cigar, this came from the FDA re, uh, studies themselves, the average cigar smoker, not you guys, who smokes 1.6 cigars a month. As such, there's no increased mortality of smoking cigars. We're not smoking. Kids don't smoke them. So, but we're still battling, we're still battling all these issues. But this coronavirus is, is a tough one. But at least in the old days, we we're battling all these other issues, FDA and smoking bans. It's all about ourselves, all of these supreme cigar industry. We were just uh, us against the world. If we went out of business, they would say good luck in life. But now with this coronavirus, it's just not only our small business, our industry that's getting affected. It's the whole freaking small business, the whole country, the whole world. So I think government's trying to find ways to uh, get us back on, on track. But it's so it's, if it's just us, we'd be screwed. But I think I have, I'm a bit optimist all my, my life. I've, I've never seen anything like, like this. I think I can't wait to get through this. And um, it's it's been tough. We we have a scar factory in Tampa. We have our factory in Nicaragua where we make our brick house and corn cigars. But in Tampa, we're still working every day. We have, uh, we make, I, you know, we, am I jumping the gun here about our factory re 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 renovations? Or should I continue with that, uh, Drew, Joey? No, uh, no, you're, you're you're doing awesome. I mean, you know, you you I mean, the 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 lessons are perfect, right? You you have to try to be as patient as you can, watch cash flow, take care of your employees, make sure that you can pivot when you need to pivot, and you do bring up a good point. It's not just us, quote unquote, premium cigars against the world. It's just it's just everybody. It has to feel the effects of it. And your business has to pivot. Your business has to pivot online. Um, I've been saying that for years here on the Story Geek Show for the, for the brick and mortars. They need to go online. They need to go online. They need to go online. Curbside service is like putting a Band-Aid on something that really needs stitches, in my opinion. Because let's face it, if you're down 80%, 
because you get other sources of revenue within your business. Lighters, cutters, alcohol, if you serve alcohol. I mean, your business is down. You might be in the 20 to 30 percent business. Now it's down 70 percent. If those are your numbers again, now you got to learn how to survive on 30 percent. And it might be for the rest of 2020. It might be till fall. We just don't know. And I think that's it's it's a certain uh, unknown there. But yeah, so uh, if you could just wrap up right quick on COVID and what you guys are doing to protect your factory workers and all of that. And then uh, I'm sure Drew has a question about the renovations and stuff like that. You know, you talked about going to online business. Smart retailers have converted a long time ago, but it's uh, a lot A lot of them haven't. But we're taking care of our workers. During the Great Depression, 1932, when we were in Cleveland, when General Motors had a plant that they closed for two years, my grandfather ran two shifts, making two cent cigars. Didn't make any money, get people employed. I met with our our employees um, about uh, our workers last week, week before, week before that. We said, we are going to keep you employed. I said, back at that time, I said, there was 22 million people that are unemployed. And we're, we're bound to determine to keep our factory going. And I said, part of my spiel was, do you all know anybody that's been laid off? And they all raised their hand. Of course, they have anybody, restaurants, dry cleaners, bars, they're all. Uh, I said, we're going to work. I said, even if we don't have the work for you, we're going to pay, pay, pay you. Um, what we did was, in our cigar-making department, in about 14 machines, we make about 60,000 cigars a day. We said, okay, we're going to run split shifts. One week, half the, half the factory will work making cigars. The other half will be off. Next week, you do the other way around. Same thing in our shipping department. But we, we work split, split shifts. I said, if you come to work, you'll get paid. If we tell you to stay at home, you'll still get get paid. And we, we have social distancing. We have we have these stations where you wash your hands, hand sanitizer. Then everybody's wearing wearing mask. Um, fortunately, we're, we can still in, stay in business, still operate. We are not open to the public yet. We don't give tours anymore. We don't do a lot of these things just for ourselves. We distribute cigars to retailers that are open, to the online people, to the liquor stores. So we're very fortunate to be open. Our business isn't as strong as it once was, but it's still, people are still smoking. Um, some people are smoking more cigars because you're stuck at home all day. You know, one of the biggest problems, my grandfather and father used to smoke five cigars a day. Now you can't smoke five cigars a week. I smoke a couple cigars a week if I'm lucky because you're always moving, always doing things. Plus, you go inside, you can't smoke anywhere inside. But if people are at home, and people are getting cabin fever, they're bored. In some cases, that helps scar sales because they have time to smoke and and uh, which they normally w- w- wouldn't. So it's uh, we're just adapting. It, this thing is changing day- daily. Um, sometimes some states are going to open up, some are not. Some stay at home, some's not. Um, our people, our employees are coming to work every day. They're nervous. They're nervous about getting the coronavirus. They're Everybody's nervous. I mean, you, you, all you do is watch TV and it makes you sick, not with the virus, just because it, it's, it's like you have a panic attack. So, um, again, we've been through this for 125 years, and we just can't wait to get this in the rearview mirror. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your methodology with doing split shifts, uh, the banking industry is actually utilizing that uh, as well. So you have like an A and B shifts, week on, week off, or two weeks on, two weeks off, and or, or whatever the cadence is. Uh, this way you keep the people working in clusters. So you have your, your group of 10 or 20, uh, but it's the same 10 or 20 people. So, so the banking industry is actually doing that. I think it's great that you're able to still sustain – and, um, you know, because one in six Americans are collected unemployment, I guess the number is up to now. So, you know, uh, it's 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 uh, kudos to you for keeping it open and doing that, um, you know, for sure. Uh, it's 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 uh, we will get past this. You certainly will get past this for sure. Being an older business. And then once we get out of that storm you're going to go back into the premium cigar FDA regulation storm, which I don't know which one, you know, it's like, you know, uh, but we're doing that. We're doing that as we speak. Yesterday, we finally got a favorable ruling. Joe, you won't, you won't believe this one. 
this is the first time they ever remember that we and the FDA were on the same side of an issue. We both I know, right? The court. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we both petitioned the courts. We were supposed to have a big uh, regulation, um, supposed to support, it's called substantial equivalence. FDA has a right to take off everything off the market we've introduced in the last 13 years, unless we can prove it's substantially equivalent. In their words, to scars we made before 2007. It takes a lot of paperwork, a lot of testing, a lot of run, running around, and it's very difficult to, to comply. So difficult, FDA never got, a, never got around to giving us guidance on how we're supposed to comply. That doesn't, don't bother us with the details. They haven't shown us how they want us to comply. Anyway, February, uh, May 12th was the uh, due date. Because of the coronavirus, they've, everybody's agreed that they should give us a d- delay. FDA is not working, so they, we aren't, you know, our, our, our folks aren't working, so they give us a four month uh, stay of execution. So hopefully between now and four months, we'll be able to figure this out. We've also been working uh, with Santa Rubio and Congressman um, Castor here in, in, in Florida to uh, work this bill through Congress to get premium scars exempt from re- regulation. There's, uh, but no standalone bill goes anywhere. We try to get attached to an omnibus bill that nobody reads, 10,000 pages. That That hasn't worked yet either. But really the truth of it is, we are not the enemy. We are a, the amount of cigars. The amount of cigar premium cigars represents one one hundredth one percent of all the tobacco products sold in this country. We are not even a rounding error. There's some in Washington who like to see us go out of business. They're after cigarettes. The they people smoke with Easter cigarettes. We are not the culprit. But we're just getting uh, in Washington. Sometimes they use one size fits all remedy to all their ills. ills. So we've been battling a very expensive uh, effort. We're all pushing. We're all members of Scar Rights of America, spending millions and millions of dollars with attorney fees, battling in in court, trying to get us uh, uh, some relief so we don't have to uh, prove we're substantially, our cigars are substantially equivalent. And next year, we have to test all of our cigars. They want us to test for nicotine, we think, gum, tars, as if we're cigarettes. We have to send those results to them in the middle of 2021. There's two problems. There's a lot of problems. One, it's very expensive. And one of those, you can't test cigars like you test cigarettes. Cigarettes, there's maybe only four or five different shapes. Cigars, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different shapes, different inhalation styles. And the machines don't even exist to test cigars like cigarettes. It's going to cost us maybe $20,000 per skew. It's going to cost us millions of dollars. It's going to cost our competitors millions of dollars to, to comply. So we've been trying to get an exemption from, from reg- regulation. I know when Donald Trump became president, he believed that the regulation or regulation kills small business. was no better example of that is than what overregulation is doing to our little industry. We're paying three, three, two hundred dollars a day, and call them user fees. No, they don't even call us taxes. Call them user fees. We can, we don't pay it. We're tax collectors. We pay the government the money. We pass it on to the retailer. He pays us. He passes it on to the consumer at the higher prices. So it, it's it's a real mess. But we can keep keep that going. What we can't do is we can't come out with a new blend because we can't contribute cigars to silent charities. We send a lot of cigars to the military. You, you get your butt shot at in Afghanistan, Iraq. You want to go back to your barracks after a hard, hard day at the office, hard day getting shot at in the, in the, in the trenches. And, and we can't even give cigars to the military because they're afraid that you'll they actually will not, not like them. Those regulations, those are, those are tough, but it's really the compliance regulations. There's no way we can spend millions and millions of dollars to try to prove to the government that the scars are making today are the same scars on same SKUs that we made 13 years ago. We don't even have those red records. Plus, cigars are made out of tobacco. Tobacco is natural. What happens is no two cigars are alike. They're all made by hand. And the crop varies from year to year to year. If it rains a lot, you're going to get kind of a washed out crop with low nicotine. If one year you have a crop that doesn't have a lot of rain, you get fatter, heavier, more nicotine in the leaves. So it's almost like an act of God that determines the nicotine content level of c- c- cigars because they are a unique 
product. And we're so different than cigarettes, so different from smokeless and vape. And we're trying to get this exemption. We've been working for 12 years at it. We are cautiously optimistic. We may get some relief because we don't. We deserve to get re- relief. We are not the we are not the uh, people that's uh, caused the problem. But in Washington, one size fits all. So we're still fighting this battle with FDA every single day. Coronavirus or not? You got me worked up. That was that was. Uh, I'll fighting. tell you if 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 we edit this video, you can send it right to the FDA. It's perfect. They throw over our, our, our <laughs> arguments. We, you know, it, it, and, it, it brings up you know, all try, the points, right? It brings up the points of the nicotine content, how it varies per, per, per crop. Uh, if, 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 worry, if it talks about the business regulation, how making it more regulated will uh, not hinder on creativity of the cigar. It talks about the difference of uh, other tobacco products and premium cigars. I mean, it's everything that I've been saying for, for years and years and years, um, you know, on the FDA. I've been talking publicly about the FDA since uh, 2015 um, there. And, you know, it's uh, it's it's just amazing how they haven't come up with, with any sort of a solution. But I think it will come after COVID and all this. It's got to be coming soon. Um, and then you also bring up the point, you know, if, if they raise it and whatnot, like I've been saying since 2015, uh, uh, 2015 they're going to pass it on to the consumers. That's how business is done. It is what it is, you know. So not that you want to do that. You you know, you love your consumers. But realistically speaking, if you raise the price 70 cents, we're going to pay it because we enjoy – I enjoy those Diamond Crown M- Maduros. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Go live. You know? Music, music to, to to my ears. Thank you. I love the I love the Diamond Crown Maduro. I've I've yeah, I went on a tour with taste. those. I love those. You know. But anyway, uh, Drew, chime in, please. Yeah. No. <clears throat> so my my question to you uh, is just talking about the uh, the uh, when you broke ground last year on the uh, multi million dollar factory expansion. Uh, I know a lot of people I spoke with. They're like, wow, you know, that's you know they they've been watching the clip. It's the snippets that you you've been doing from the factory. And just going, you know, over that. Uh, how's that coming along? And uh, how how did that get uh, to be a, a topic? I guess on a roundtable discussion uh, when you guys were going to go ahead and do something like this to the factory. That's a hundred nine years old. Well, Drew, I have a son named Drew. His idea. Drew is fourth g- g- generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just has a fifth generation about a month ago. So we're thrilled about that. He lives in Brooklyn. He's our legal. He's our general counsel. He also ran more of our, more of our bid, 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 bid business. There, Drew had this idea that Dad, this it's going to be a 125th anniversary. We live in the Cigar City. We need to mm-hmm. celebrate. We need to have as a gift to the city, a city which was the Cigar City one time had 120 had 150 factories. Now we're the only one left. Let's showcase our factory to bring cigars to showcase what cigar making was all about in its heyday. So our plan was to turn our factory into a tourist attraction to be the premier cigar destination in the United States. We have a factory in Nicaragua. A lot of people go visit Nicaragua, Dominican Republic. It's hard to get to Managua and Santiago. Here you come come to Tampa. But what we are doing is we want to turn our factory into the uh, destination like the Bourbon Trail is in K- K- Kentucky. Yes. You walk in, yes. you walk into our factory, it's like walking back in time. Mm. We're making cigars the same way my grandfather made them on old antique cigar, hand-operated cigar machines made in the 1930s. <clears throat> We're also making cigars by hand. I have a brand called The American, which is another story, which maybe we will get 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 to. Basically, yeah. what our renovation consists of, we're tripling the size of our museum on the first floor. We're going to put a factory store also on the first floor. Second floor, mm. we're going to put a mini movie theater showing videos of of uh, Ybor City and, and and interviews with different cigar personalities around the uh, country. The top floor, we're putting in a hand cigar factory within our factory with 12 rollers and a lector, more more part of our m- m- museum. Then we're going to give uh, tours, open tours to the public. Our museum is free. The first part of it will be free. We're also going to be giving guided tours. Again, walking through our factory, like walking walking back in time. Uh, we've had a – the renovation should be finished um, in a, by the end of uh, May. We plan to have a public celebration at the end of May and and become a real tourist attraction. 
when Bush Gardens closed, Disney World closed, the world has changed. So we're still uh, going full forth. We obviously aren't going to be open to the public before anybody else is, but we are getting closer. Yeah, you talked. Some of you all talked earlier about some of the fun things we found in our in our factory in a renovation. We discovered an old set of stairs that was blocked for like 60 years. Like just like at home, you have an attic, you put a lot of junk in your attic. We had so much crap around. So to do the renovation, we had to do a lot of clean up. We found these old stairs that went from the general manager's office at the time all the way down to the basement. Tampa had a Cigar City Mafia. Surprise, so surprise. In the 1930s, a lot of cigar factories, every factory got robbed. When it was your turn to get robbed, you just took it like a man because it was just your turn. It was, you don't want to piss off the mafia. All the cigar makers back in those days got paid in cash, and it, life was tough. The fact we moved from Cleveland to Tampa in 53, people that owned the factory originally with the Regensburgs, they had built some secret stairs. So we had, um, so if they were paying out the money in the, in the main office there, and they started to get robbed, they run to the next room, open up some stairs, go down, all the way down these stairs, into the basement, and go around the corner and go to another vault, and they hid. And we uncovered those stairs. That's going to be part of our museum tour. And uh, it's kind of kind of cool. Go, and you can go down the stairs, too. But it, we didn't even know it was, it was there. There's so much lore in this history of, of Tampa, and it's like any old, old town. A lot of stories, a lot of fun, and we can't wait to show it off. You have to come see it when we're finished. Come see it when be able to, to travel and hopefully that won't be too far in the future oh yeah that's what i was telling joe uh, la uh late last year i said uh can't wait for this renovation to get done and then to go down and do a, a segment down there with y'all <clears throat> and just uh and showcase the new factory um so we have been talking about that for sure uh in getting down to tampa uh, to yeah i go place. down to uh fort lauderdale or pompano beach uh every year for um, one of my two family vacations, or, or I go to Hilton Head uh, as well. And this year I had planned in the fall to get down there as well, but we're going to have to see with, with travel and all of that stuff. But if not, then definitely when restrictions allow us and all of that stuff, I, I'm certainly going to going to take take the trip down there uh totally i'm i'm i love old old office uh factory buildings when mm -hmm. i uh had my first uh advertising agency we actually were part of a restoration project and all of that stuff totally love like that that whole scene over there and and how when when you're doing restoration or renovation you find so many cool things from it's like opening up a time machine so yeah. I, I I can't wait to go. Yeah, I was going to say the new stuff too. Uh, uh, Eric is going to be exciting for, uh, I, and I think a lot of educational as well for people to go down there and check out the new uh, uh, rolling gallery uh, where they can see the handmade cigar production uh, there. Uh, you know, live and, and understand tobacco, you know, understand, you know, the, the the intricacies of rolling a cigar and and not only that, but what is added to the cigar, you know, that's all natural. And so to that, uh, I look forward to seeing that as well. And I know a lot of people I've talked to, they're like, yeah, they're, it's definitely going to be a destination to, to go to when we go down to Florida. Plus, we call me a romantic. Cigar rolling but, classes but, and talk about cigar tastings and make it just like you go to Napa Valley. You mm -hmm. just sample the wine, and you, you yeah. know. But this, you make you make cigars. You can't make wine. You make you make cigars. It'll be an education all the way around. Yeah, oh, call, yeah. call me a, absolutely. Call me a romantic. When I did pre Stogie Geeks, I I had a uh, cigar radio show called C Cigar Club Radio. It was here in the Providence Metro, and every event that I did with the radio station, you couldn't smoke in the restaurants, right? But I always had a cigar roller on premise just rolling the cigars while i was on the radio people would come down and get their cigar and then do that there and then kind of see that visual presentation we talked about it on the radio him rolling the process we had to use total i i actually had to use a translator um the the radio station was like giving me hell saying you know you want to roll cigars at a restaurant but not smoke them, and you want to interview someone on the radio with a translator, like, that's not going to make good radio. That's going to make great radio. I go, because the Yankees do it all the time 
with the pitching staff, so why can't right. I? And we were actually on a uh, Yankees uh, station at the time here in the Providence Metro. So they kind of laughed it off, and, and, and it went very well. And then after the event on the radio, I was on air from, from 4 to 6 p.m., and then from there – uh, we would go to a local cigar shop and everybody would take their hand rolled cigars and drive next to where the restaurant was and all of that. It was a super cool evening where, you yeah. know, you're like, I, I don't know. Like, I remember way back in the day, um, uh, Alec Bradley had uh, specials when when they came out with the original Tempest series where you mm -hmm. could meet the roller. You know, it was a talk, talk, talk about an event. That was like well, well orchestrated and put together. You were able to actually get one of those cigars from the roller right then and there. Now, the good news yeah. about that is once you get a cigar that's been rolled, you actually have 24 hours to smoke that cigar or you need to have it wait for 30 to 45 days. That's yeah. the only downside. But it's just so romantic to, to just see that process. And, and so for, for the Stogie Geek listener to <clears throat> have Tampa be a destination and walk into the J.C. Newman factory, not only is it going to be like stepping back in time, not only is it going to be like, wow, we're stir crazy. This is crazy, right, from this COVID thing. Now we get to step back in time and see this process. It's, it's going right. to do – it's, it's going to be a way – it was great for uh, uh, Drew to put that together because it's something that you're going to celebrate even after your 125th year uh, in in business over there. Right. Well, thank you. well, my son Drew's had a lot of ideas. One of his ideas didn't always agree with, but it's all it's okay. It's great. <laughs> Funny idea. It's a different generation. I'm sure my yeah. father didn't agree with everything I did, and. I wanted to do, and, and, and my grandfather didn't agree with what my father wanted to, to do as well. But Drew, my son, my son Drew, just wanted to bring a hand cigar making back to our factory and bring it back to Ybor City. And he yeah. said, Dad, I want to start making a cigar. And this is like three or three, three years ago. And the first cigar made in our factory, which is known as El Relo, in fact, all these old factories in Tampa had nicknames. Our factory was called Every Low, which is Spanish for clock, the clock factory. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you told any old timer you're going to go to El Rey Low, they know exactly where you were where you were going. But Drew said, "I want to." The first cigar fact, first cigar brand that was made in 1910 when the factory was built was called the American. And Drew said, "Dad, I want to make the American by hand." I said. You want to do what? I want to make hand cigar fa hand cigars in our factory. I said, Drew, that's a terrible idea. Labor is eight <laughs> times what it is in, the, in our factory in, in Nicaragua. Do that. It's, it's a you, you lose money on. Well, that not only that. I want to make an American cigar, purely American, American mm, wrapper, yeah. American binder, American filler, American boxes, American bands, American label. So that they see a lousy idea. The rapper, what he sees do, I said, Drew, I'll tell you what, you can wait till your mother and I die and get your inheritance, or you get it now. You're not going to make it, you lose money on it. So, Dad, I want to mm. do it. Well, it's, it's, it's yours, son. Do what you want to do. The rapper we have comes from, uh, there was another uh, guy that's a visionary named Jeff Borschwitz. Mm. Jeff's a retailer in Orlando, as a, as a, as a uh, store in Tampa. He's a frustrated farmer. Wrapper tobacco hasn't been grown in Florida. Cigar tobacco hasn't been grown in Florida since 1970s. You want to grow tobacco. So he starts out this experiment, cigar tobacco, in Claremont, Florida, not too far from Orlando. And this is this eventually became the FSG filler. FSG, as I think Drew Estates has a brand called Make Some Form FSG. They get mm -hmm. the filler, but we get the wrapper, the outside leaf. And it's a wrapper for our American cigar. We use Connecticut broadleaf binder, but there was no long filler grown in this country. So we got the Mennonites in Pennsylvania to grow some tobacco for us. So that is the heart of our tobacco with Jeff's wrapper, Connecticut broadleaf binder, Mennonite grown Pennsylvania filler. It's called the uh, American. It sells between $16 and $20. We have two rollers now. We each make 100 cigars a day. Most cigar makers around the country, around the world, are paying a piecework basis. The more cigars you make, the more money you make. Because it's hard to make handmade cigars when we don't have a real handmade factory. So the our cigar makers have to sort the tobacco, select it, case it, strip it. Say, so I'll tell you what, you teach our rollers, you make 
100 cigars a day, and that's it. So your incentive is to make 100 of the best cigars, not the most cigars, and they've done that. The cigar boxes. I mean, I, we get cigar boxes made for five bucks in uh, Nicaragua. We not good enough for, for my son Drew. No, it has to be made in America. We go to Miami, <laughs> get these boxes for twenty dollars a piece. I said, Drew, you get the same thing, Dad. I want to make an American, American molds, American band, American. Anyway, and we're going to expand upon that. But when we finish our cigar factory up on the third floor, we'll get we'll get more rollers and we'll get that operation. But we're still making 200 cigars a day, called the uh, American. It's such a lousy idea. It's a great, great idea. But it's a different world out there. I'm sure my father I think it's a great, great idea. It's off the wall, and it's a generational thing. So we're excited about that as well. I think it's a great I idea. Hopefully, uh, uh, Drew's uh, young enough where you can tell him what to do. Tell him tell he has him. to come on Stogie Geeks, and I want to hear – yeah. His version of the story as well, because he, 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 he's got a lot of innovative version. ideas. And I think it's really creative, especially now that, you know, in your case, it's the fourth generation. Right. Um, yeah. Times have changed. Things have changed. I'm sure he has more ideas in his head. Uh, I definitely would 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 love to have him on the show. So if you can relay the message, that would be yeah, awesome I'd love to, to be on the show. You know, uh, and then also, like, I think it's a great idea because I've actually had the American at Casa Fuente over in Vegas. So yeah. we visited Casa Fuente over in Vegas, did all of that. Uh, and, and let me tell you something. They're really onto something. And, and, and it's funny because I remember when I got the press release when, you know, J.C. Newman was going to produce a cigar here, here only in America. I remember saying, man, this cigar is going to be like $80 a stick. You know, <laughs> you know, because of the label laws, because that was the first thing I thought of. Like, oh, my God, like like they're, they're going to, you know, are they going to compete with Davidoff from a price range? But no, you guys, you guys were able to keep the price at, at a good price point. Uh, and, 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 and really, it gives uh, uh, our stogie geeks or cigar enthusiasts or cigar aficionados, however you want to label us. Right. Uh, it's something to really smoke history like like he. He had a vision in his head of producing that, and then he did it. And to my knowledge, it looks like, and then from my perspective, it looks like he did it with success. So kudos yeah. to him, for sure. Every generation has their ideas, their, their, their vision of how they like to see things go. Drew has his. Can't wait till we get their renovations finished. Can't wait till we get coronavirus behind us so we can go back to business as normal. We have our factory operating in, in um J.C. Newman Penza in Esley, Nicaragua, where we make our brick house, Pearl Del Mar, and Quorum. Nicaragua is doing, they're, 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 they're still hanging in there. I know Honduras is closed now. The Dominican Republic has been closed, and they hopefully open up the next week, week or so. But this pandemic has struck everybody, everybody hard. And, and you know, we could have had a conversation eight weeks ago. Things have been normal. We wouldn't this this thing thing came on so suddenly. I, I still can't believe it. I don't even know the real definition of the word surreal, but there was. I think the coronavirus is that what they've caused because this is so unbelievable. Nobody ever saw it coming, and uh, and it doesn't discriminate. It affects Republicans, Democrats, Democrats, rich or poor, all kind of races. The FDA, cigar smokers, non-cigar smokers, equally. It is uh, equal opportunity. So we, we're, st you know, we're kind of struggling with this. But um, anyway, you know, credit, credit to you, you know, cigar geeks. So, you know, I talk about the cigar boom. Oh, back in the 80s, and business really sucked. Nobody cared. And Scar Fistinato came out. You guys are promoting the love, the enjoyment, the camaraderie of smoking. C c c cigars, which uh, I mean, if you told me when I got in the business, they're actually TV shows, radio shows. I don't even know what a blog was, but actually talking about cigars, I said you're you're smoking something funny. It's not cigars either, but it's a credit to you. You're giving people the opportunity, cigar lovers, the idea to converse with one another, to meet us and others, and you all, and, and talk to cigars. And it's probably even gotten more popular now that nobody can really get out of the house often. Often, so you're an outlet for extent, uh, for providing information. Uh, you know what's happening. That you know these are all levers of the leaf. And 
cigars are so unique. I you know, tell people you get two strangers come into a, a store in a lounge, two walks of life, what you name it, wherever, a, a general, a janitor, or a custodian, whatever. And by the time they sat down, you smoke a cigar, be on your show, not be on your show, and they talk sports, politics, music, all problems of the world. And I can think of no other product that brings people together like cigars. In fact, if more people in this country smoke cigars, we wouldn't have the divisiveness we have in our country that we have now. Oh, I thought you were going to say... <laughs> no, thank you. I thought you were going to say there's no other device that brings people together like a diamond crown. <laughs> yeah, I, should, I should mention the brand, too. The diamond yeah, crown, you Maximus, should. No, but, Julius no, Caesar. No. It's, uh, oh, yeah. you know, we've been partners with the Fuente family for, for so long. In 1990, it's my father's idea for a diamond crown. He wanted to, to uh, work with the Fuentes to make a special cigar for our upcoming then 100th anniversary. Dad wanted to make best cigar it's ever been, and they didn't care what it cost, how long it took to make, not even whether it says it would sell or not. So Dad got with the, with uh, Carlito and his father, and it was kind of interesting. He wanted to use a uh, ferm- uh, double fermented Connecticut shade wrapper, and where Diamond Crown has been used double Connecticut shade wrapper for since it started in 1995. And I uh, use five-year-old age filler, Dominican filler. And it's and that also wanted to make 54 ring size cigars. Dad knew that the thicker the cigar, the more flavor you can maintain the continuity of taste, blending six, seven, eight leaves at a time. Back in 1990, the biggest shape cigar, biggest ring size was 50. And Dad's not wanting to make it 54. They had no molds for 54. So Carl said he gets some special molds and and we were the first large ring size cigar. Now a 54 ring is nothing. You get 60 ring, 70 ring, 80 ring. But Diamond Crown Classic has done so well since 1995. And it's kind of interesting. During the cigar boom, you got a lot of new cigar smokers come in. And they want mild, you know, mild. They don't, they, don't want, they don't want to get their socks knocked off. Or they don't want to kill their taste buds. But just like when you drink, uh, start drinking bourbon or scotch or vodka, you start in the empty level, and then pretty soon you want to have a stronger, full flavor, full bodied scotch or bourbon. So people are saying, why don't you change in the late 90s, change, change your blend of Diamond Crown, give it more body to it? We said, we don't want to. People like our blend of Diamond Crown. But then we came out with a brand called Diamond Crown Maximus, which had more oomph to it, an Ecuador Havana seed wrapper from the top of the plant. And and in 1990, in 2010, in honor of my grandfather's 135th birthday, came with a brand called Julius Caesar, which has a lot of flavor as well. Julius Caesar was my grand- grandfather. But Diamond Crown is, is the same cigar now it was 30 years ago. Life has changed. We used to use a lot of Connecticut shade wrapper. Connecticut, Connecticut, you try, you know, you're from up, up there, see the, the cheesecloth. Now, there's very little Connecticut, Connecticut grown tobacco because people found out you can take those seeds, take them to Ecuador, have, a, have Connecticut shade tobacco grown Ecuador, kind of looks the same, doesn't taste the same. And a lot of our competitors have gone to Ecuador because it's cheaper. But since we in the Fuente start our businesses based on the real Connecticut, Connecticut shade wrapper, we're keeping the Connecticut wrapper as it was back 25 years ago. So that, that we think that's one thing that makes Diamond Crown special, the real deal. It's hard to get. And a lot of our competitors have shifted to the cheaper tobacco. But uh, we're keeping Diamond Crown right, right, right where it is. It's interesting. Um, in uh, You ever heard of, of J&R, Lou Roth, from basically, I tell you, are we, are we yeah. over? Can you tell the story? Well, yeah, tell the story. Go for it. Okay. You know, during the, the cigar boom, life was crazy. You know, we had big smokes. Remember, you know, big smokes, cigar aficionado used to have them. used to be nine or ten, ten a year. Now they only have a couple left. But at Haiti, Haiti, there's nine, nine or ten. And there was a big smoke in New York every May. And my father and I would fly up there with my, my brother. And we always go first to see our biggest customer, who was Santa Clara, J. J. and R. So our fellow named Lou Rothman. And this was like 2002. 
who we say, we go visit, we have to sell cigars to Lou. Lou says, I have a factory in Nicaragua. How about I had cigars from my factory? I says, no, Lou, we're here to sell you cigars, not to buy cigars. No, you should buy cigars from my factory. So, okay, we, we, we you know, listened to them, couldn't say no to big customers. So we kind of um, said, okay, we'll give you an, an order, but we couldn't find a brand. We believe in brands. And to make any cigar, make any product go, you need, need to have a brand. So back 20 years ago, we used to have these trademark registries where you could get a look at every trademark in the country of anything before there was the internet. And every time we wanted, we found a brand that was, we thought we had a good name for a cigar, the name was taken. Um, one day I saw a word, Quorum. I thought that'd be a great name for a cigar. And, mm-hmm. and but uh, look, it was, it was taken. So my brother's talking to Lou Rothman and said, we want your cigars. We can't find a brand. We said, for instance, we want to get Quorum. And Lou Rothman said, well, who do you think owns that brand? And we said, we don't know. He says, I do it. I'll sell it to you for a dollar a year if you just make cigars my factory. He goes, just want people to buy cigars in his factory. So we started up an operation. We, we, we started buying cigars from his factory in 2003, a brand we made there called, called Quorum. And the brand got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we got concerned that one of our, some of our competitors who did not have a factory in Nicaragua would buy, either buy that factory and either quit making cigars for us or they'd raise the price so much we couldn't sell. So in 2011, we built our own factory, brand today called called J.C. Newman Penza in Estuary. A quorum there, we make our Brickhouse, Perla de Del Mar, and Elba Baton cigars. And we have uh, about 800, fact, 800 employees in our factory in, in Nicaragua. We have about 130 in Tampa. And uh, again, the labor in Tampa is about eight times what it is in N- 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 Nicaragua. And then we're still doing, you know, point they are making a damn crown cigars for us. We're still selling cigars for uh, for Fuente, so it's been quite quite a ride. The world is changing; it continues to to change. I feel bad for our retailers to today. Some of them either are closed or doing that curbside business. And you're right, curbside. Some are doing pretty well. Some of them quite haven't figured out. One of the smartest people in this industry is a guy named Dave Graflo. Owns two guy smoke shops in New Hampshire. He's Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's you a beast. Neighbor? Yeah. From Rhode Island. <laughs> he's the beast of the yeah. Northeast. <laughs> yeah. He is. And he's he's he, uh, swear, a sweetheart of a guy. He said, you should write a book on how to run a curb service. He did write a book. He did write a book. He did write a book. Did write a book. It's called David and Goliath. Goliath. It's funny. He wrote his book, All These Ways to Promote Cigars, and got like 95 different ideas. And Zetter said, 95 is good enough. Not good enough. You need to make it 100. And Dave says, give me an hour. Came back with an hour. Here's five more. The guy's a g- g- genius. And he is. He's he a, is. An inspiration to the sky and to all of us you know, because he thinks outside the, 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 the box, doesn't take no for an answer, politically c- connected, and um, very, very special guy. I wish we could clone him. And he's got so many great ideas. Every problem out there, he turns into an opera. I mean, one of my you know, favorite Dave Garoppolo stories, everybody is, was after all the scar people to donate for silent auction, donate for, 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 for charities. We're all given to charity. Only Dave Garoppolo could find, the, find a way to make a donation to a charity good for his business. What he did, he would, he would raffle off cigar seminars, cigar tastings, in his store, and maybe it's worth a couple hundred dollars, whatever, he'd give to him, give people cigars. People, people never smoke cigars. Come to a store, how do you cut, how do you light, how do you smoke? And nine times out of ten, they came customers. I mean, old Dave, only Dave Garofalo came with a, another idea, made $100,000. But you know how you go into most stores, everything is rounded off to 95 cents. Five ninety-five, six ninety-five, eight ninety-five. They get 99 cents. They have 95 cents. You make $100,000. He does. He makes an extra $100,000 a year by rounding off to 99 cents instead of 95 cents. And nobody says a word, of course. I mean, that's no, like absolutely. Thing. I've actually, I actually know a few humidor managers uh, who actually tell me off record that, like, when they speak to Dave Garofalo uh, about their, their, 
humidor management and all that stuff, how his advice is just amazing. I've had a bunch of managers, um, you know, uh, just talk to me in general because, you know, um, I have a couple down south. I have a couple here in the northeast, a couple in the Midwest that kind of, you know, check into Stogie Geeks and give, um, you know, a kind of like a barometer as to like what the environment is like in multiple times. They've had yeah. said, like, like you know, talking to Dave Garofalo is is a smart move, and I agree. I agree, and and not, and not for nothing. Even if you're a small retailer, I mean, look up Two Guys Smoke Shop and in over in New Hampshire, and um, give them a call and 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 say, hey, I got a small shop. Well, I'm in the middle of COVID. I got to get to some sort of level. Uh, it, to my knowledge, he, he would definitely take some some time out or at least point you in the right direction. He's a super nice guy. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Drew, do you have a, a final question for Eric? Uh, no, just, you know, like I said, going back to the uh, to the renovation, you know, like I said, the experience from uh, for what what's coming up in the in the, in the future uh, sooner than later. Uh, it's just it's phenomenal. I mean, just to just to the the, the rolling gallery, uh, the aging rooms, the tobacco storage, and then also I mean something that I I actually when I read the article about mm, late last year, I believe it was was talking about the company plans to have a uh, raised podium for an elector to read to the rollers just like the cigar factories used to do back in the uh, back in the old days, which I didn't know what that was, but that was that that seems pretty cool. Is there something you could touch on that, Eric? So back in those days, the, uh, the lecturer would read the news of the day. They read books. The cigar makers are pretty much uneducated. That's how they got their, mm. their, their education. And making cigars could be a mundane job after a while. But they would read the newspaper. Everybody wants to know what's what's going on. And that was the mm. lecturer, the, the reader. And again, my son, Drew, said, let's build a lecturer stand and, and we'll get a lecturer, maybe not every day, but once we get the sure. business up and, up and going there to... Uh, he wants to bring back the uh, the way it was 100 years ago. And bring Sounds back like he's a smart boy. And, the, and, and just the way it was, oh, yeah. to show people the way it was done, and we're still doing it to, to, today. It's such a, a it's such a crazy, off-the-cuff idea. It's probably a great idea. I wouldn't oh, yeah. ever thought of it. I've never spent the money. It's his inheritance. It's okay. <laughs> well, well, I'm still here. He, I have an idea. He's, got, I'm, a, I'm he's, got, right a, he's got a lot of great I'm ideas, Eric. I'm wearing a mask. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a lot of great ideas. Uh, as a parent, you must be very proud uh, of of what he's accomplished so far. And I think he's gonna, you know, he's he's gonna do you guys proud. Uh, moving on to the future, I mean, he's got a very very good cadence about him. I kind of silently follow him along, and 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 I think he's come up with with a bunch of great ideas. Every time I speak to your marketing PR person, I'm like, you gotta get Eric on the show. Like he's such a it's just he's such a breath of fresh air where I think the industry needs that. And I think you making the Tampa factory a destination is a smart right. move. And I think the brick and mortars need to actually do that as well. They need to, 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 to make their fa uh, factory, their uh, brick and mortar establishment, whether you have, uh, you know, 100 facings or, or 6,000 facings, either way, you really need to make your place a destination. Because I do feel that post-COVID, Consumers are really gonna decide where they're gonna spend their their dollars, and it has nothing to do with the premium cigar industry. It's gonna be cascaded into restaurants, uh, meals and entertainment, uh, all types of stuff. So absolutely, and and you're gonna come back on the show and give give us an update as well um, as to what's going on, especially when when you open up and when some of these restrictions get released in this COVID era that we're in. Well, see if I have to go to Astley for to visit the Scott Factory tour. I mean, I mean, Drew Estates gave great tours. Nick, my friend Nick Redoma, has great, great tours. It's just mm -hmm. a pain in the butt to get to get that down there. But it's not easy to get to Tampa. Hope you get the real cigar experience in Tampa. Our captain go to another country, and we invite everybody to come to visit us. Uh, we'll be we'll be ready to go. I'm afraid before this coronavirus issue is solved. So. Uh, We'll be ready, and when the when you, the stay at home orders are lifted, and life gets back to normal, or maybe the new normal, we'll be ready to go. And we look forward to welcoming everybody to our factory in Tampa and help us celebrate 
our 125th year in business. Oh yeah. Sure. And the next time we get you on, I want to take some times and talk about the brands. I'm really into these quorums uh, as yes. well. Uh, I'm not just a uh, a diamond crown uh, uh, consumer as well. I, I, I like the Julius Caesar, but that diamond crown Maduro is really something special, at least for me. I, I really enjoy that stick. It goes excellent with a Bloody Mary. I have I have proven that many times here on Stogie Geeks. Well, that diamond crown Maduro is that's used a Connecticut barley wrapper. That's what they make for us, but the Connecticut Broadleaf, where Connecticut shade has become like a dinosaur in Connecticut up there, as fewer and fewer farmers are growing that shade tobacco, Connecticut Broadleaf is very popular. So mm-hmm. you have good taste. Uh, don't tell my son, but when I t- talk to my son, Drew, about going on your show, he said, Dad, you got to talk about brands, brands, brands. Not at all. Probably, oh, too, too many stories, but not even the brands. So the next time we come back, we'll say, Drew, you come back on the show and you, you talk, talk brands. <laughs> yeah, honestly, Stogie Geeks, I love to talk about business, 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 and sustainability of the business. Um, because if you don't talk about sustain- su- sustainability of the business and you don't talk about um, that, brands are secondary. Building a brand is fun, right? Doing logos and doing all that stuff is fun. But if you don't build awareness of the business and concept of the business, it doesn't matter if so many people like like your brand. Um, you know, it, it, they are equally important for sure. But I mean, having someone like you who who's been obviously in the business for a long time and third generation, I'm so happy that we were able to get this interview. I'm glad that we had a chance to talk about the business. And next time, maybe you and Drew can come on together and talk about the the uh, band, the uh, brands because I do. Uh, we do do stick reviews as uh, throughout the year with all of the brands that you have to offer and all of that type of stuff. And we do drive people to to your website. <clears throat> so Stogie Geeks, definitely go to your Google browser and type in J C Newman. And uh, check them out. Uh, they make a lot of super cool brands. If you sign up for the newsletter, you can get updates as to how the renovation process is going. Um, you have a kind of spotlight uh, shadow box, I think you call it, video series as well that you guys are doing, which um, you know definitely keeps the consumer in tune as to what's going down on, uh, over at the factory. So. Kudos to you for, 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 uh, I saw for, for, that, for that as well. I saw that the first time last week. What happened is we have an old museum, and we had like 14 or 16 shadow boxes. And I used to give tours in our museums, and I know all these stories. I said, before you destroy our old museum, before we built a new one, somebody there video me telling stories, because once it's gone, it's gone. One day I may, may be gone. So they, they did that. And uh, last week I saw they put it to music from Banjo Music, and they called a Shadowbox series, which I thought was was kind of uh, kind of interesting. A lot, a lot. I of think it's a great idea. It's a great idea to live the legacy for sure. Yeah. Yeah, one more point I'd like to bring: it's not even okay. brands. Something that's we're very proud of. The twenties are are very very proud of. In um, around 1999 or 2000, Carlito and I were riding around his chapter there, Fuente, and we saw these kids playing in, in the street. And he was explaining to me that there's not enough schools in the Dominican Republic. There's schools that are in double session. They should be in school. This is during school session. And uh, that, you know, that wasn't, and that wasn't really good. So we said, we just gone, we went through a uh, scar boom. And so we need to give people, we need to thank the people of the Dominican Republic for growing the best tobacco, making best of cigars. But let's join, let's do something. So we're going to build a wing on the local school so the kids can go to school. We uh, went a little further and we saw some girls carrying jugs of water on their shoulders. And I said, Carly, what are they, what are they doing with the water? I said, you won't believe it, but most of these little huts have no water in their homes, water in their homes, shacks. And the kids have to walk as much as two hours, sorry, two miles from the river to bring water to home. And even then, the water is not fit to drink. So that's not right. We should give them clean drinking water. So Carlito and I in 2000 had this vision. We had a school clean drink drinking water. And then Carlos met a fellow who runs the largest humanitarian organization in the Dominican Republic. Told us about us, our Gringos idea about this, like wing on a school. Said, you don't want to build, you don't want to 
but build a wing. Our school didn't become part of the government. You want to build your own school. So with a lot of effort in the early 2002, we start, started a Cigar Family Charitable Foundation. We bought 23 acres in one of the most impoverished areas of the Dominican Republic. And in September 6, 2004, we opened up our primary school. Great day. We had open days. We had 800 people there, the media, the politicians, the parents. Everybody thought it was great. Grades pre-K through eighth grade. About four months later, Carlito called me and says, we have a problem in our school. So we can't have a problem. Everybody loves us. He says, the problem is about the eighth grade girls got hold of them and said, we love our school. But the closest high school is an hour away walking. They want us to build a high school. I said, Carlos, we have no money to build high school. Doesn't matter, we have to build a high school. So Carlos and I both together co-signed a loan for a million dollars at the Bank of Tampa, which has since been paid off. We built a high school, then a medical clinic. Anyway, that's the heart of our Cigar Family Charitable Foundation. We have like 5,000 students and their families using our project every day. It's called Cigar Family, Cigar Family Charitable Foundation. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's I could, awesome. I can, uh, that's super cool. And, 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 it, and it's a testament as to, you know, again, you see a problem and you, and you do your best to try to solve it. That's what a lot of business owners do. So, right. uh, Eric, I want to encourage you not to be a stranger to the Stogie Geek show. I want to thank you for your time, uh, for uh, appearing here on Stogie Geeks. Go ahead, Drew. Take us out. No, I want to, hey, Eric. So I just wanted to put a shout out there on your, uh, so I know there's a, uh, you guys just kicked off a, uh, Hashtag brick house at my house contest. Uh, do you want to touch on that real quick? Our marketing firm came up with this. The idea is that you can't smoke. You can't smoke in a, in a smoke shop anymore because the lounges there are closed. So we have yes. our brick house brand, which is named after a, my grandfather only was born the only brick house in the village of Hungary. One of his first friends was called Brick House. We, re we renovated about 12 years ago. And it's it's a contest. You uh, you you get a, you can buy a brick house. You buy a box brick house. You get some cool stuff with it. If you po go this go you post on social media, on Facebook. It's a contest. And if you're chosen with the best post, you get a prize. And and uh, yeah. that's uh, about as much as I know about. You probably know more about that than I do. Yeah, I yeah, do. And I'll make it I'll make it a lot easier for you, Stogie geeks who are Thank listening you. or all right. or watching over at home. If you follow us on social media. Uh, Stogie Geeks on Facebook or myself or Drew on Twitter, uh, actually, or Sto uh, Sto Stogie Geeks on Twitter as well. All of the information is posted up there. you got to use a specific hashtag, and away you go, and you can get everything. So, yeah, it's a great, great opportunity to pay homage to the bricks and mortars that have to learn to reposition and pivot through through this COVID. And also to jcnewman.com for the same information as well. And there, there's so many hashtags. I'm. Oh, I remember we got our first fax m m machine about 40 years ago, and we didn't couldn't figure out how that worked. <laughs> Up until I started business, we got all of our orders either in the mail or on phone occasionally. And then we had faxes, and then we went to online, and now the social media. It's it's a changing world. Unfortunately, we have yeah. people that that part of our team. That handles this. We have Adria. She's our social media guru. And um, there's a lot of people smarter than I am when it comes to tech technology, including you guys. So I'm sure that the new generation can figure this all out. So uh, anyway, oh, yeah. thank goodness for, for them. Thank goodness for, for you all. But uh, we appreciate your mentioning our brick house, uh, smoking brick house at your house contest. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Adria and your social media team does a great job. We always share all of that over on the Stogie Geeks and our stuff as well. So uh, all of the listeners know uh, and are aware of any contests that you guys bring up. Uh, Eric, I want to thank you for your time. I want to uh, thank, you. thank you for um, everything that you've said, for sharing the stories with us. They were great stories. Don't be a stranger to Stogie Geeks. And I want to encourage you to be safe, uh, as always, as we can get through this uh, pandemic here and move on to business. It would be awesome if we can. And uh, I'm hoping with that it's it's now going to be more sooner than later. So, Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Drew, for giving me this time to tell a few stories about the industry that I've worked in for 
48 years now. And thank you for sending time ready to us as well. Thank you. Thank you. There you thank go. You. So if Go you've been box. in the industry for 48 years, you must have started when you were two years old. There you go. You lie and I'll <laughs> swear to it. There you go. There you go. Stogie Geeks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we got the stick of the week. We'll be right back. <laughs> 